As we prepare to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you are invited to join us for a special virtual Ash Wednesday worship experience. Wednesday, February 17th at 7 p.m. We will also observe the Lord's Supper. Items needed for the Lord's Supper are bread of any kind, unleavened bread or crackers if possible, dark red juice, grape juice or a non-alcoholic wine, if possible. And designate a member or members of your household to gather everyone and serve the elements of the Lord's Supper. Join us for a special virtual Ash Wednesday worship experience. Wednesday, February 17th at 7 p.m. as we kick off this season of Lent. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to Revive Wednesday Bible Study. Have you ever thought about, as a person of faith, what it means to be independent? Well, tonight, that's what we're going to talk about. But before we go any further, let's go to God in prayer. Oh, God, our provider, we're so thankful to you for all of your tremendous blessings. We thank you, God, for your goodness, your mercy, your love. We thank you for what you've done for us through Christ Jesus, our Savior, our Lord. We thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit. And we pray, God, that you will lead us and guide us in this Bible study that we may glean from our engagement with your word everything that you desire for us to extract from it. We pray over every participant in this worship experience. Please lead us and guide us. Help us to be the people that you have created and called us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen. For those of you who are streaming with us tonight, we got one major favor to ask of you. For those of you who are streaming with us on Facebook, please make sure that you share. Hit the share button. That's right. Go ahead and do it now so you don't forget. Hit the share button. And, uh, and not only hit the share button, but also make sure you hit the post button as well. <laughs> now, for those of you who are streaming with us by way of YouTube, we want you to be a subscriber. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel. All of this helps us to get the word out about the great things that are happening here at the Friendship Community Church. Now, please turn with me in your Bibles to Ruth chapter 2, verses 17 through 20. And if you don't have a Bible, don't worry. Uh, in very, very short order, we will be uh, going to our scripture. And when we do so, you'll have it on your screen. We'll put it up on your screen on whatever device you're streaming with us on tonight. All right? But... Uh, Ruth chapter 2, verses 17 through 20, uh, that passage of Scripture serves as our foundation for tonight's Bible study. We're continuing our latest teaching and preaching series that is entitled Friends with Benefits. I like that title uh, because it gets us to thinking, but it, it doesn't mean quite what you may be thinking that it means. Friends with Benefits is nothing untoward, but no, Friends with Benefits, this is a message series about the importance, the benefit of godly relationships, godly connections. And, and so we look forward to sharing with you tonight about um, God's perspective on our independence. And so this is where we're going to start. In September of the year 2000, the Columbia recording artists or girl group known as Destiny's Child released a smash hit single entitled Independent Women. Chosen as the featured song of the blockbuster film Charlie's Angel, Angels, independent women dominated the airwaves and the number one spot on the Billboard Top 100 chart for nearly three months, in large part due to its extremely popular hook. That's just the chorus of an, of an R&B song. But the hook went something like this. The shoes on my feet, I bought it. The clothes I'm wearing, I bought it. The rock I'm rocking, I bought it because I depend on me. 
Um, and, and then, you know, it goes on, you know, all the women who are independent, throw your hands up with me. And, and all the honeys making money, you know, throw your hands up at me. And, and all the mamas who profit dollars, throw your hands up at me. Uh, all the ladies who truly feel me, throw your hands up. You know, you know the song. You, you, know, you know the song. It's a cute song. Cute song. However, theologically, I just have one issue, and that is that the main premise of the song is built upon a fallacy. The major, the major premise of the song is built upon a lie. For anybody with any sense knows that any monicum of success that any of us has ever had that any of us has ever achieved has come by way of the fact that the Lord has allowed it. The shoes on my feet, God did it. The clothes I'm wearing, God did it. For those of us who are blessed to be rocking some rocks, yep, God did all of that as well. Everything that we have, we have it because the Lord our God has blessed us with it. That's important for us to understand, especially as we meet these two women, these friends with benefits, these, these two women with a godly connection in our text. In, in, in the book of Ruth, we meet several, several persons, but in particular, we meet two women who are seemingly independent. They have, unfortunately, lost everything, everything that the culture says has value. Naomi has lost her husband and her two sons, Malon and Kilion. And Ruth, her, her daughter-in-law, has, has lost her husband, one of Naomi's two sons. And, and not only ha has Ruth lost her husband, Ruth has left her homeland, Moab, uh, to go with her mother-in-law back to her homeland, which is Bethlehem. You see, uh, originally, Elimelech and Naomi, Elimelech is Naomi's husband, they left with their two sons and went to Moab because of a famine. Well, the famine was so severe that it also, that it also impacted the landscape in Moab. And so Elimelech died, uh, Naomi's two sons died. Before they died, they married two Moabite women, Ruth was one of those women. And now that all of the men in their lives have, have gone away, Ruth clings to her mother-in-law, Naomi, and decides that she is going to leave her homeland and go back to Naomi's homeland, Bethlehem. She uh, does away with all of the cultural norms of, of that time, of, of, of the ancient Middle East cultural norms that would have not just suggested but really regulated that Ruth stay back in Moab and go back to her own family, she, uh, she, she does away with, with all of those conventional mores of her culture and she clings to her mother-in-law. She clings to her mother-in-law. Clearly, Naomi must have been a woman of God for a daughter-in-law to cling with a mother-in-law, cling to a mother-in-law so much so that she leaves her homeland and goes to her mother-in-law's homeland to live. I mean, that's a godly relationship. Those are friends with benefits. And though they seem to be independent, one of the things that we're going to discover is that these two single, seemingly independent women, although they, they have the appearance of independence and although they have the appearance of being left alone, struggling to make it on their own, our text reveals to us that Naomi and Ruth, that they know far better than our limited 21st century lenses enable us to really perceive. Ruth has just finished working a double shift, gleaning and scavenging in the barley and wheat fields of a man of great standing or as other translations of the Bible put it, a man of valor, a man of valor named Boaz. Her hard work has paid off, and Ruth has been handsomely, handsomely rewarded for her efforts. In fact, verses 17 through 20 tell us, check the text, 
So Ruth gleaned in the field until evening. Then she threshed the barley she had gathered, and it amounted to about an ephah. That, that's about 50 pounds. She carried it back to town, and her mother-in-law saw how much she had gathered. Ruth also brought out and gave her what she had left over after she had eaten enough. And her mother-in-law asked her, where did you glean today? Where did you work? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. Then Ruth told her mother-in-law about the one at whose place she had been working. The name of the man I worked with today is Boaz, she said. The Lord bless him, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law. He has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead. She added, that man is our close relative. He is one of our guardian redeemers. Go, go back to verse Verse 20, this is important. The Lord bless him, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law. He has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead. The living and the dead. Please don't rush past that. For this one statement pronounced by Naomi marks a huge shift in her life. This woman who has lost everything that her society, everything that the culture says has worth, everything that the culture says has value, this seemingly independent woman who appears to be left to struggle on her own and subsequently is of the belief that God does not see her as a friend, who is subsequently of the belief that God sees her not as a daughter, but rather that God sees her as his enemy because of everything that she's had to suffer, everything that she's lost. She is convinced that God doesn't see her as a friend, that God does not see her as a daughter, but that God sees her as an enemy. Why else would she be suffering the way that she's suffering? Because of what has now happened, she now sees that God has not forsaken her. Because of the events that transpire, in our passage, Ruth chapter 2, verses 17 through 20, we just read it. Because of the events that transpire in our passage of Scripture for this evening, Naomi now sees that God has not forsaken her, that God has not forgotten about her, that God has not declared her as his enemy. Naomi sees Ruth, and Naomi sees all that Ruth has been able to, to accomplish. And Naomi is so overwhelmed by this significant blessing which provided her with the sign that she so desperately wanted and needed. The sign that God was still with her. Naomi breaks out in a prayer of praise. She says, Lord, bless him. She, she says, she says, Lord, bless him, the one who has done this, the one who has been so good to my daughter-in-law. Lord, bless him, the one who is responsible for this wonderful act. And then she says, not about Boaz. Mm -mm. The first part was about Boaz. Lord, bless him. The him in that is, is Boaz. She's talking about Boaz. But now she turns her attention from Boaz and she turns her focus to her God. And she says, not about Boaz, but about her God. She says, he has not stopped showing his kindness. You say, but Torin, how do you know that she's not talking about Boaz? How do you know that she's talking about God? Can I teach it? It's because of the verbiage that she employs. She, she says, he has not stopped showing his kindness. Stop right there. The word that is translated in our text as kindness is the Hebrew word chesed, H-E-S-E-D, chesed. And there is no direct English translation of the Hebrew word chesed. 
the best that we can do is a definition. God's ever-loving kindness. Now notice I said God's ever-loving kindness. It's, it's because this is an attribute of God. And most often when you see the word employed chesed, it is not a word that is used to describe something that a human being has done. But typically, in the Old Testament, when we see the usage of the word chesed, it is a reference to something that God has done. And so from that, we can glean from the text that Naomi has taken her attention away from her relative Boaz and has now placed her attention on the Lord, her God. And so she says, he, God, has not stopped showing his kindness. She, she, makes, she makes a turn. She shifts. She thought that he had stopped loving her. She thought that he had stopped caring for her. She thought that he had made her his number one enemy. But she says, no, I can't think that way anymore. Got to stop my pity party. No, he has not stopped showing his kindness, his chesed, his ever-loving kindness to the living and the dead. And the dead. What, 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 what a wonderful day it is for Naomi. The question is, however, can we, can we handle it? I know, I know. You say, Torn, what do you mean, can we handle it? That sounds universally good. I don't know why you emphasize those three words and the dead, but other than that, I don't know why you would think that we can't handle this. Well, please understand that in our text, what we have presented before us is a radically monotheistic theological position. I'll say it again. What we have in our text is a radically monotheistic theological position a radically monotheistic, monotheistic theological position that is implied here that not only underscores our text, but underscores the entire book of Ruth. That is what we find in, the, in this text, a radically monotheistic theological position that not only underscores our text, but underscores the entire book of of Ruth, which is, here's our first point of power, the God who allows us to experience good times is also the exact same God who allows us to experience bad times. That is a radically monotheistic theological position, that the God who blesses us to experience great times, the God who blesses us to experience great laughter is also the God who allows us to experience horrible times. The God who allows us to experience times in which we are absolutely inconsolable, inconsolable, drowning in our tears. That is a radically monotheistic theological position. You see, for as much as some of us deeply spiritual residents of third heaven folk, as much as we try to and want to force Naomi to forget about her losses of yesterday and just revel in her blessings of today, girl, you got to get over that, you know, that was yesterday. As much as we want Naomi to forget about her losses of yesterday and her grief of yesterday and just revel in her blessings and the good tidings of today, understand, sister girl does not oblige. Sister girl ain't having it. No, Naomi says, God has not stopped, has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and to the dead, and the dead. Listen, the reason why I keep emphasizing those three words, and the dead, is because in those three words, and the dead, Naomi makes us 
have to wrestle with the fact that the same God who allows us to experience joy is the same God who allows us to experience dejection. As much as we want to make Naomi forget about what happened to her yesterday, as much as we want to make Naomi forget about her losses, she says, you can't make me forget about my losses. And she says that God has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead. I'm going to remember what I've lost. God hadn't stopped showing his kindness to the living. She could have stopped there, but she doesn't. She said, forget y'all. I'm not going to keep just moving. I'm not just going to pretend like what happened to me didn't happen to me. God has not stopped, stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead. She remembers, and she makes us have to wrestle with the fact that the same God who allows us to experience elation is the same God who allows us to experience depression. I know you don't like that, but the same God who allows us to experience love is the same God who allows us to experience loss. I love Naomi for that. As difficult of, of a teaching that this is, I love it because it's necessary teaching. It's necessary for us to remember. You can't really move forward unless you remember that even, that even at the worst times of your life, that God has still been good to you, but he's not good to you in a way in which he forces you to forget about what you've lost. But he's good to you in spite of what he has allowed you to lose. That is the radical, monotheistic, theological position that is outlined and underscores, and saturates, and drenches, seasons, marinates our text in the entire book of Ruth. If you don't get that about God, you can't get this book of Ruth. The same God who allows us to experience great love is the same God who allows us to experience great loss. I, I love Naomi for helping us wrestle with this. I, I love Naomi for, for not forgetting. I love Naomi for this. I love Naomi for the mere fact that she says, no, no, no. Don't you dare try to make me feel like I didn't lose my husband. I, I, I know that there's some people out there who can relate to that. She, she says, no, no, don't you dare try to make me feel like I didn't lose my children. She, she says, no, 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 uh -uh, uh -uh. Don't, don't, don't you dare come with some wacky theology about I can shout it out. No, 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 don't you dare try to make me feel like what happened to me did not happen to me just so that your concept of God can fit nicely and neatly inside of your little box. Naomi says, no, I know better. I went through it. No. The same God who has given me happiness today. I don't know why God did it, but he allowed me to experience heartbreak yesterday. Yet, and that brings us to our second point of power. I've come to find out through Naomi that the awesome thing about God is that regardless of whether times are good or times are bad, God is always with us. In great times, in terrible times, God is with us. And that's the awesome thing about God. Yeah, gr granddaddy and, and grandmama, they, they, they were absolutely right that, that even when you cannot track God, you can still trust God. God is with you. All right. And put it like this, um, my beautiful wife, Tiffany Nicole, um, she is a lover of, um, of those uh, kind of murder mystery shows. I mean, she loves, <laughs> loves them. Um, you know, how to, wait, how to Get Away with Murder, uh, um, CSI, Los Angeles, New York, New Orleans, whatever, uh, whatever city they in. She, I mean, loves all that, you know, First 48, Forensic Files. I mean, she, she loves all that kind of stuff. 
And, uh, and so even though that's not necessarily my cup of tea, um, I, I have uh, kind of forced myself to watch enough of those shows in order to pick up a pattern. And, and one of the patterns that I've discovered in those shows is, is that when the detectives arrive on the scene, one of the first things that they do is they began to look for fingerprints. And uh, as, they, as they dust for fingerprints, after the fingerprints or after their dusting ha has been analyzed or however they do it, whatever, whatever they take, when they go back to the lab, yeah. Uh, what, what I have discovered is, is, that they will, is that they will often, often discover by way of the fingerprints and the analysis of the fingerprints, that they will discover that, uh, that there was someone present at the scene that they didn't realize previously was present at the scene. Yeah, when they go through their analysis of the fingerprints and all that stuff, what they do, you know, one of the things that they oftentimes discover is that there was someone present on the scene that they did not previously realize was present on the scene. Oh, this is going to be real good. I, I need y'all to come. I need y'all to come a whole lot closer tonight. But because, because if you were to go back and, and, and if you were to dust for fingerprints at the scene of all of your bad times, if, if, you, were, if you were to go back to the scene and, and dust for fingerprints during all of the horrific events that have transpired in your life, if you were to go back to, to all of the downright ugly periods of your life and dust for divine fingerprints, I, I'm talking about those times in your life when, when, you, when you thought that, that you were left having to struggle all by yourself, when you thought that, that you were left having to scuffle all by yourself, if you would just go back and dust for fingerprints, you would come to discover that there was somebody present at every one of those scenes that you never realized. If you just went back and dusted for divine fingerprints, you will discover that when the conditions of your life were at their worst, God was right there by your side. And I just got to know, I know, I know it's Bible study, but I've just got to know, is there anybody out there in our virtual worship space who is dependent enough on God to say, thank you, God, for always being with me. Thank you, God, for always being by my side. Thank you, God, for never leaving me nor forsaking me. You, you might not see him, but God is with you. You might not feel him, but God is with you. You may not understand why God is making you contend with what you are having to contend with, but God is with you. And as long as God is with you, you can be certain that God is going to bring you through what you are going through. God loves you too much to leave you by yourself. God, he's always, always with you. Um, he, he's, he's with you. I, 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 I wish I had more profound, a more profound way, a more prolific way of saying it, but I don't. God is with you. I, I don't know who I'm talking to tonight, but I just, I want to drill that down. I want you to understand that. No matter what you're dealing with right now, God, in all of your not understanding why God is allowing, in all of your confusion about why God is letting this happen, just know God is with you. And, and, and check this, check this. The only thing that the presence of God, ooh, it's going to get even gooder. I know that's, that's not a real word, but I say it anyway. It's going to get even gooder. The only thing that the presence of God's love in our lives is contingent upon is God's faithfulness, not ours. The only thing, in case you think I said that the wrong way, the only thing that God's love for us is contingent upon, the only thing that God's 
care and concern for us. The only thing that God's presence in our lives is contingent upon is God's faithfulness, not ours. I know, I know, I just, I just completely messed some people up right there. I, I know there's some folks watching me right now that you, you want to debate that with me because, because you have you've made it up in your mind uh, that, that the reason why God is present in your life is because you come to church every Sunday and, and you're in Bible study every Wednesday. You, you, you have made up in your mind that the reason why God blesses you is because of all of the things that you do. You, you've made up in your mind that the reason why God is so good to you is because you, you're so good. And I, and I want to suggest to you, no, 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 I want to impress it upon you that the reason why God is good to you ain't because you good, but the reason why God is good to you is because God is great. <laughs> the reason why God has been blessing your life is not because you're so wonderful. No, the reason why God has been blessing you is because God is wonderful. The reason why God is sticking it in with you through thick and through thin is not because of your faithfulness, but the reason why God hangs in there with us through thick and through thin, through the ups and the downs, the good times, the bad times, the downright ugly times, is because God is faithful. Listen, listen. There, there is no doubt that as Naomi, as Naomi goes from one emotional extreme to the other, just as we all do. There's no doubt about it that Naomi does indeed get some things majorly twisted. That whole thing about don't call me Naomi, call me Mara because I'm bitter. Life has made me bitter. God, God sees me as public enemy, number one. Now, she got that twisted. But it's not just her. We all get this stuff twisted from time to time. We can all get in our back. We can all get in our feelings to the point that we get it twisted. Understand, don't forget that prior to Ruth walking in the door, Naomi, she's lost everything. Women in, ancient, in the ancient Middle East, they had no rights. They needed the men in their lives for protection. Women had no legal standing. It was difficult even for a woman to own property in the ancient Middle East. They had no rights. And so that's why it was so important for a woman after she left the house of her father to, to, to be with a good husband and to have, pray for them to have male sons so that those male sons would be able to take care of her, protect her after her husband died. All of that was gone. No daddy, no husband, no sons, no nothing. Naomi is in desperate straits. Naomi, prior to Ruth walking in the door, she believes that God has forsaken her. Naomi believes that she is God's enemy. And so there's no doubt, no doubt that Naomi's faith is a little faulty. No doubt that Naomi's faith is far from perfect. And I know you don't like me talking about Naomi, but you ought to be G-L-A-D glad about the faultiness of her faith, about the imperfections of her faith, because what Naomi teaches us is that here's our third point of power. We all ought to be thankful for the fact that our faith in God does not have to be perfect in order for us to experience the love of God. Can I say that one more again? Our faith in God does not have to be perfect in order for us to experience the love of God. Oh, man. This thing is just going from good to gooder to, to even gooder than gooder. L listen, hear, hear me today. But because, because the truth of the matter is, here's our fourth point of power. The truth of the matter is that despite our dysfunctional faith, God still loves us. Despite our faulty faith, God still loves us. Despite our imperfect faith, God still loves us. 
And if you can't praise God tonight for anything else, you ought to praise God for the fact that despite your faulty faith, despite your imperfect faith, God still loves you. All of the times that you thought that God has turned his back on you, God was still loving on you. All of those times that you thought that God had forgotten about you, God was still loving on you. All of the times that you thought that God had forsaken you, please know that God was still loving you. All of those times that you said, forget church, I'm telling you, God still was loving on you. All of those times that you wanted to quit, all of those times that you wanted to throw in the towel, all those times that you wanted to wave your white flag, I'm here to tell you that God was still and God is still loving on you. God loves you. And his love for you is predicated on God's perfectness, not, not ours. Naomi. Naomi is home. She's depressed and she's hangry. Not hungry. She's hangry. She's lamenting over all that she's lost. And she is just about convinced herself that God no longer cares about her. She is just about convinced herself that God no longer cares about her. When all of a sudden, she hears something. It's the little rickety, raggedy door opening. And she sees a shadow, Ruth, coming in the door. And, 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 and she sees Ruth. Uh, Na Naomi sees Ruth handing her dinner with one hand and, and holding uh, a sack of 50 or more pounds of grain in the other arm. That Na Naomi, she, she sees Ruth and, and she sees her holding her dinner in one hand and this overflowing sack of freshly picked grain with the other. And, and right then and there, Naomi says to herself, God does. Yeah, God does. God does still care about me. Understand, here's our fifth point of power. God often expresses his love by using his people to help those who are hurting. At, at that point in our text, Ruth, that hashtag ride or die chick that she is, at that point in the text, Ruth does something for Naomi that nobody else can do for Naomi. At that juncture in the text, Ruth does something for Naomi that nobody else is in position to do right then and right there. Through her acts, she expresses God's love. Earlier in the pandemic, had that kind of experience. You heard me mention my, my, my awesome wife, Tiffany, earlier. I mentioned her again. But early in the pandemic, um, I received word from Indianapolis, Indiana, the, uh, the birth, well, not the birth home, but the, the, the place where my father was, was reared and raised, um, and uh, received word that uh, one, one of my aunts, his only sister, um, that she passed away. And it was at a time in the pandemic where we knew enough about the coronavirus that we knew that, you know, travel was just not something that we would be able to do. And, um, you know, it was kind of rough because, um, you know, my cousin, her uh, son, is more like a you know, older brother than a cousin, just that close. And um, whenever we would go up to Indianapolis for, for the summer, and, and I'm sharing this not just to share about me, but I, I'm sure that there are others out there who can identify with this experience. But 
um, whenever we would go up to Indianapolis for the summer, and there was a time when I was younger in which we did that, you know, just about every summer, we would go up to Indianapolis to check on family up there, and uh, my parents, they would stay with my dad's twin brother. He's going on to be with the Lord as well. Um, but uh, I would always stay with this particular aunt. And, uh, and so, man, it was, uh, it was kind of tough, but you kind of have to know me. I process things. I'm much more of a head person than a heart person. And so processing things with me, you, you just not going to see me just, you know, having just big breakdowns and stuff like that's just not me. Uh, it's not that I'm trying to be anything. That's just not me. Uh, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. It's just not touring. Um, much more of a head person than a heart, than a, you know, than a heart person. And uh, and so, but it got to me one particular, um, one particular night. And uh, uh, after I'd said my prayers, and and I was just sitting on the bed, and um, you know, I, I just started just weeping. And uh, and Tiffany. She, uh, she noticed, I guess, that um, I was just sitting on the side of the bed for a while, and uh, she just came and, and sat by me, um, rubbed me on the, on the back, put her arm around me, and, um, and man, it just made such a, a huge difference in terms of helping me. She didn't really say anything, um, but, but just her presence just meant the world and all, and really helped. And, you know, I figured out why. It's because Tiffany was the only person in the world that could have done that for me. Tiffany did something for me at that point in time that nobody else in the entire world could do for me. In that time of need, She was present with me. I mean, she was right there for me to be able to lean on. She expressed God's love to me. And and so so on that that night, I I realized something, um, and certainly as thinking about that night, I want to share what I realized with you. that experience, it reaffirmed, here's our sixth point of power, it reaffirmed in me that we all need the love of God too much to ever want to be independent. Let's pray about it. Oh God, our provider, you're so you're so awesome, you're so wonderful, you're so kind, you're so loving. So much so that even at those times in our lives in which we don't understand what you're doing or why you're doing to us, what you're doing to us, we do know that we can trust you. And so we thank you for being able to depend on you We thank you for not having to be independent. We thank you for not having to do it by ourselves, strike off on our own. So right now, not only do we thank you for this faith that we have, but we pray for those who are on E, for those who are in dark places right now, for those who are really relating to Naomi right now, both women as well as men, but both adults as well as kids who are really relating to just how beaten up Naomi was feeling. So we pray for them right now that they will feel your presence through godly connections, that you will dispatch Ruth-like people to their lives so that they can experience your love, so that they can experience your care and concern through others. 
Oh, God, we thank you. We love you. We lift you. We praise your name for every godly relationship that you've blessed us with. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Listen, if you're watching this evening and you don't have a connection to God that goes through Jesus Christ, and you don't know how to do that, you know, it's something that you feel as though you need, but you just don't know how to do. Let me tell you something. Don't let tonight end without establishing that kind of relationship. Don't let tonight end without establishing a connection to God that goes through Jesus Christ. It is the most important thing that you could ever do. And it's not something that you need to put off. You got to do it right here and right now. If you don't have a connection to God that goes through Jesus Christ, I implore you, I urge you, do it right here. Do it right now. There are seven days in a week, and none of them are named some day. What we have is right now, right here. And so we urge you to receive Christ. One of the very simple ways in which you can receive Christ is by praying the prayer of salvation. Matter of fact, you can, you can repeat these words, the prayer of salvation. You can do it right now. I, I want to lead you in that prayer, if you will allow me. Come on, repeat after me. Oh God, you are my redeemer. I admit that I am a sinner. And so I thank you for Jesus and the cross. I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord. And I believe in my heart that you raised him from the grave. And because of what you have done, I am saved for now and forever. Amen and amen. You prayed that prayer with, with certainty and sincerity. The words are absolutely true. You are saved for now and forever. Amen and amen. Welcome to the family. But listen, here's what we need you to do. We want you to let us know about your decision. And the way that you let us know about your decision is simply by texting the word friend to the number that you see on the screen. 404-637-2223. Simply text the word friend to the number that you see on the screen. And I tell you, we, ha we have nothing better to do than to celebrate what God is doing in your life. But now you may say, Torrin, I have a connection to God that goes through Jesus Christ, but I don't have a connection to a ministry. But I'm feeling what y'all are doing. I'm really enjoying this series. And I want to know how can I be a part. I want to know how I can be down. Well, that too is also very simple. Simply text the word friend again to the number that you see on the screen. 404-637-2223. And I'll tell you as well, we have nothing better to do than to celebrate what God is doing in your life. Hallelujah. Listen, for those of you who have been just so awesome in supporting um, this ministry, whether it is by way of our food ministry, we praise God for, for your food donations and your support of the food ministry. If you want to donate non-perishable, uh, shell-secure item, canned good to our food ministry, the information is on the screen. But we praise God for you helping us to meet the needs of those who are in need in our community. We praise God for that. We also, we praise God for you. We also praise God for those of you who have remained so steadfast, I mean, in just an absolutely awesome way in regard to sharing your financial gifts. We praise God for those of you who have continued throughout the course of the pandemic and all, to support this ministry financially. We thank you for your tithes and your offerings and your sacrificial giving. We praise God for you, and we pray that God will continue to bless and keep you. This segment, it is not to beat anybody down. It's here to build you up because we're absolutely convicted about this fact, that biblical giving, it honors God, and God honors our biblical giving. We're convinced and we're convicted of that. 
so much so that we take time out of every worship experience to talk about just how good God is at abiding by, at living by, at living out God's word. You can count on God to do exactly what God says God will do. And so we praise God for those who are continuing to give. Hallelujah. As a matter of fact, let's go to our, to our prayerful petition, our, uh, our prayerful affirmation in regard to our giving. Raise those right hands with me. Repeat after me. In obedience to your word, I offer my gift. By faith, I receive all that you have for, for me. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Hallelujah. Listen. We look forward to sharing with you this Sunday as we continue this absolutely potent series, Friends with Benefits. Hey, tell a friend to tell a friend. And when you give them that title, you don't feel the need to explain it. Just say, watch it and you'll find out. Friends with Benefits will be back this Sunday, 8 a.m., 9.30 a.m., 11 o'clock a.m. Eastern Standard Time. We look forward to sharing with you. Until then, peace and love. Hallelujah. This is Torin Daly signing off of our Revive Wednesday Bible study experience. We'll see you real soon. God bless you and God keep you is my prayer. Here is this week's news. In addition to giving electronically through the giving kiosk, the church website, or through your personal online banking system, Friendship also offers a text giving option. Simply text your text giving amount to 404-948-5006. Tithes and offerings can also be mailed or brought to the church during the new office hours Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. until 1.30 p.m. and 3 p.m. until 5 p.m. Streaming worship times are 8 a.m., 9.30 a.m. and 11 a.m. These dynamic experiences are available on YouTube, Facebook, as well as the call-in line. Join us for prayer on Mondays at 7 a.m. We look forward to sharing with you at our Revive Wednesday worship streaming experiences at 7 p.m. This is a practical and passionate study of God's Word. The Lord's Supper will take place Sunday, February 14th at 8 a.m., 9.30 a.m. and 11 a.m. Items needed for the Lord's Supper are bread of any kind, unleavened bread or crackers if possible, dark red juice, grape juice, or a non-alcoholic wine, if possible. And designate a member or members of your household to gather everyone and serve the elements of the Lord's Supper. Virtual book discussion of Educated by Tara Westover, March 11th. Please check weekly email for additional information. To those of you joining us by way of YouTube, please subscribe to our channel. Select the bell so that you will be notified when Friendship is streaming on YouTube. If you are joining us by way of Facebook, we invite you to like us, follow us, and host a watch party to help us get the good news out about Jesus Christ. Check the website and weekly email for live group material. The church is open from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Monday through Friday to receive donations of non-perishable items and canned goods. For more information and for the latest updates and details, be sure to visit myfriendshipcommunity.com, join the Friendship Weekly email blast, or contact the church office. Be sure to follow us, like us, and subscribe to stay connected to Friendship Community Church where friendship is more than a word and Christ is the head.